Hi everybody, welcome to Elementary Classical Mechanics, the subject where observing the universe suggests new mathematical and computational approaches that can literally transform our way of modeling and predicting any aspect of the world. Welcome back to the fourth lecture of Chapter 6, where we're going to discuss Example 8. Okay, here's the situation we have. We have a particle that sits on top of a sphere, and we slightly displace it so that it slides down the sphere, doesn't roll, and there's no friction. I'll give you a picture in a minute. So we want to know two things. The position of the particle as it leaves the sphere, and the speed of the particle at the instant it leaves the sphere. Now the only forces acting on the particle would be gravity, and if the, the horizontal component is i and the vertical component, ver, horizontal unit vector is i, ver, vertical unit vector is j, then the only force acting on the particle is gravity, downwards, and the normal force. Particles moving along the sphere, particle presses down on the sphere due to gravity, sphere presses straight back. Newton's third law. Okay, so this is the picture we have. The only force is downwards, so um, we can consider the, a cross section of the sphere, or it looks like a circle. The top of the sphere is A, P is a particle, and it's going to be easiest to use a moving set of coordinate systems moved with the particle, polar coordinates. And we're going to use what we developed earlier in the course on the, the uh, unit vectors for the polar coordinate system. But I'll get to that in a second. So those would be R1 and theta1. R1 is in the direction, the radial direction, locating P, and theta1 is in the direction of increasing theta. Okay? I and J are just the uh, usual unit vectors. All right, in the fixed unit vectors, uh, fixed in direction, fixed in length. Okay, so we have the weight and the normal force. So we're using R1 and theta1 to um, describe the motion. So we need to express the weight, the gravitational force, in terms of R1 and theta1. The normal force, because it's normal, it's automatically it, in the direction of R1. That's the direction of the normal force, the radial. Okay, so we use our expression for resolving or writing the vector w in terms of components multiplied by the unit vectors r1 and theta1. So we're going to need j dot r1, j dot theta1. We can use a little bit of trigonometry here to express that. And we have j dot r1 is sine theta, j dot theta1 is cosine theta. Okay, plugging that into these expressions, we get the gravitational force W is minus mg sine theta R1 and minus mg cosine theta, theta1. And the normal force is just in the radial direction. Okay, so we have F equals ma. F is W plus n, and that's putting the two expressions together, writing them in the r1 and theta1 direction, and a is just the derivative that we've derived earlier. Tri the, the, the 
sorry, the second derivative of the position vector expressed in the polar coordinates. Now, something we're going to see is that uh, r equals b for this problem, the radius, and b doesn't change in time. So this is going to go away, and this is going to go away in this expression. And I've written it out in components here, and using the fact that I just said of this, these are the two equations of motion. All right, now we've done all this work to get the equations of motion. We've expressed them in the proper coordinate system. Now we've got to go back and ask, how do we use these equations of motion to answer the questions we were asked? So the first thing we want to know is what position, at its value of theta, will the particle leave the sphere? So the particle slides down. It's pressing on the sphere. The sphere is pressing back. And it's going to leave the sphere at the angular value where the normal force is zero. Because we see from this expression that as theta varies and theta dot varies, the normal force will vary. So if we could somehow express the normal force just in terms of theta, we'd be in, we could then solve for n as a function of theta, set n equals zero, and we'd have the theta value for which, for when the particle left the sphere. Well, now we have to do something a little bit clever, and I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, if you, we can get a value for theta dot squared from 6.7 to plug in, sorry, from the right-hand expression of 6.7 to plug in the left-hand side. How can we do that? Well, if we multiply 6.7 by theta dot, we see that that's the same as this expression. In other words, it's a we can integrate it with respect to time. We pick up a constant, and at the top of the sphere, theta equals pi over 2, and it's not moving. So the constant is given by we c equals g. OK, theta equals pi over 2 theta dot equals 0, c equals g. So we plug that back in, and that gives us c equals g. That gives us this expression. That's exactly what we need to get n only as a function of theta. And so we see for n equals 0, sine theta equals 2 over 3. Okay, now we want to find the speed of the particle at the moment it leaves the sphere. So we know the angle that it leaves the sphere. Okay, if we know the angle, we can go back and put it in this expression. And that will give us theta dot squared at the angle that it leaves the sphere. This expression. Or theta dot square root of this, and that's the angular velocity. If we want the um, actual velocity, we multiply it by the radius, and we get this expression. Okay, so let me go back to this. I said you had to be a little bit clever because you have two equations. And so we had to look at these two ordinary differential equations and know how to manipulate them to get what we wanted. The real trick was what I did with this equation. Multiplied it by theta, each side by theta dot and realized that it was a derivative with respect to time. How did I know to do that? Experience, playing around with equations, that's all I can tell you. I don't think there's a general algorithm for that. 
I mean, you're going to see it later on when you look at the pendulum. You'll see this is kind of like a pendulum equation. And we'll see about um, energy integrals and so on with the pendulum equation. This is a good example. You often have to just stare at equations and use experience and figure out something you've seen in the past that might give you a hint of how to solve it now. It's not like linear equations where there tends to be an algorithm. These are nonlinear equations you should recognize. Okay, so the final thing is, you know, I get to this problem and, and it's, um, and students often tell me, I don't know how to solve a mechanics problem. How do I set it up? How do I use the equations of motion to answer the questions I want? Well, I've written a section, I don't know how useful it is, but I've written it anyway, about how do you solve mechanics problems. And it's just a couple of, a couple of pages. Uh, it might be useful to think about, and uh, in any case, I leave you with that. That's the end of the main material of Chapter 6. And I want to finish up by talking about the problems at the end of Chapter 6. And it's a good problem set. And I encourage you to do all of them, and I'll give you lots of hints next time. So, bye for now.